This is Chapter 1, Part 2. Chapter 1 focuses on the prehistory in Near Eastern Civilization. Part 2 is going to end with the Neolithic period. The Neolithic Revolution expanded across the Near East and probably into Europe and Africa. Between 6,000 and 3,000 BCE, human beings also learned to mine and use copper, signifying the end of the Neolithic period and ushering in the Age of Metals. The Bronze Age extended from about 3,000 to about 1,200 BCE. A herald of the Age of Metals was the mastery of gold and silver metalworking. Gold and silver were first reduced from their ores after 3500 BCE, but their scarcity made them too precious for general use. The shift from stone tools to bronze tools occurred at first only in a few areas in the Near East, China, and Southeast Asia. Especially in Europe, Mesoamerica, and the Andes of South America, stone continued as the dominant material for the tools. Even in the modern world, such products as mortars and pestles, cutting boards and building materials, and even flooring are still made out of stone because of its usefulness. This time period was um, marked by the growth of megalithic structures from Stonehenge uh, to the pyramids. And Stonehenge is, of course, uh, in Great Britain, and it is a famous structure whose position of pillars indicate that its builders understood astronomical basics, such as the summer solstice. It used similar structures, and again, they're aligned with astronomical uh, positions, things with the sun and the stars and the moon. The date of construction of Stonehenge remains in question. It's widely believed that construction began some 5,000 years ago and was worked on in three phases over a long period of time. In any case, the stones came from a quarry miles away, which is a mystery in itself uh, for no question how these primitive people moved the massive stones without the aid of mechanical devices. Again, the exact purpose of Stonehenge remains a topic of debate. There are several theories. Some suggest it might have been a cemetery, a place of worship, or again, something to do with the summer solstice. And to this day, crowds go there on June 20th or 21st during that solstice period to celebrate the ancient mysteries of such a place. Now, during this time period, again, with the rise of the Bronze Age, came the rise of civilization. The Bronze Age, specifically, is 2300 to 1000 BCE, and that's when people began to cultivate the land and the first cities grew, and that area was in Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, the earliest successful bronze was produced by anonymous artisans, and this metalworking tradition was then trans admit it to Egypt and Greece and elsewhere. It produced a whole new series of technologies, including wall uh, writing, which is the hallmark of the period. Egyptians put words on papyrus, and Mesopotamians put words on clay tablets, and we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. But it was the Neolithic Revolution that made cities even possible. That revolution depended on agriculture and the domestication of animals. Those processes brought in their training and division of labor, government, religion, priestly classes, arts and crafts, and sciences. Taken together, along with writing, these elements add up to civilization. Now, civilization arose in Mesopotamia and slightly later in Egypt, about 3500 to 3000 BCE. Both civilizations were ruled by kings who were supported by a priestly class and shared a power with a few educated elites. Their economies were slave-based, their societies were hierarchical and stratified. Both had elaborate patterns and temples for government and ceremonial purposes. They both, though, began to produce important works of art, literature, law, and some science, mathematics, and medicine, and certainly art and architecture. Now, Mesopotamia is Greek for the word meaning between the rivers. The Tigris and Euphrates are the two rivers whose valley forms the part of what is now known as the Fertile Crescent, which starts at the Persian Gulf, or slightly northwestward through the region between the rivers, and this is roughly modern-day Iraq. And then it turns westwardly to the Mediterranean Sea and curves south along the shoreline towards Egypt. Three successive um, civilizations, three successive groups of people lived and flourished in Mesopotamia for nearly 1,500 years. They are the Sumerians, 
the Akkadians and the Babylonians. And we're going to begin with the Sumerians. And on the slide, you can see an example of their great architectural or megalithic structure. And this is called a ziggurat. And it is known for being a staircase to the gods. It was a terrace brick and mud brick pyramid, and it served as the center of worship, and again, it was stared or stepped like that so people could walk to the gods, supposedly. The Sumerian culture began in about 3500 BCE. They were the first people to use writing. They constructed these mon monumental buildings. They certainly had music and religion. Sumer's most inspirational king was Gilgamesh, who ruled during the first dynasty of 700 BCE of Ur, one of only 30 or so cities of Sumer. At one, only 30 or so cities is pretty large. His heroic adventures and exploits were later immortalized in the poem, The Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, The Epic of Gilgamesh is essentially a secular morality tale. Secular means not religious. So Gilgamesh's triumphs and failures mirror the lives of all mortals. And the Sumerians saw themselves in Gilgamesh's change from an overly confident and powerful hero to a doubting and fearful human being. Those who, like Gilgamesh, ignore the power of the deities have to pay a heavy price for their pride. And I'd like to play you just a few minutes of uh, Gilgamesh. And the section I'm going to play are the lines 1 through 38, and they are being read in ancient Babylonian. So this lasts about two minutes, so just be patient, but it's pretty neat to hear. So again, lines 1 through 38. Okay, now the Sumerians were really known for giving us cuneiform, the earliest known form of writing. On your screen, you can see this writing, and certainly the Epic of Gilgamesh was not uh, composed in writing. It was an oral tale that was written down later. But the Sumerians did write. Um, in, in their language, cuneiform was later adapted by the Babylonians and the Assyrian cultures. Cuneiform was written on clay tablets with a reed stylus, and over the three millennia in which it was used, it changed a, a lot. It became less pictogram-ish and more cursive, and the characters became more refined, moving from about a thousand characters to only 400 as they became more clear. Now, after the Sumerians, the Akkadians began to rule, 
And they ruled from about 2350 to 2000 BCE, and they tried to incorporate um, Sumerian culture into their own society. According to legends, similar to the later story of the Hebrew leader Moses, Sargon, the first and greatest Akkadian ruler, was born of lowly origins and abandoned at birth in the reed marshes. Yet he survived and rose to prominence at the Sumerian court. Now, there was also uh, the first female poet who was Akkadian uh, but wrote in Sumerian. Now, her name was Inhiduena, and she was an Akkadian poet who, again, wrote in the Sumerian language. She was made priestess of temples in the Sumerian cities of Ur and Uruk by her father, King Sargon. She used her priestly offices and her literary gifts to further his political goal of uniting the Sumerians and the Akkadians. And in these posts, she composed hymns of Sumerian and Akkadian deities. And these hymns, some of which have been identified, became models for later uh, poets. So this time period also gives us the Great Flood recounted in the Hebrew Bible in Hammurabi's legal code. Now, um, law, uh, the central theme of Sumerian law was just, and it was the most important set of laws from this time period came from the Babylonian king. And again, the Babylonians came after the Assyrians. They were the third civilization in Mesopotamia. And under their most successful military leader and renowned lawgiver, Hammurabi, they reached their political and cultural heights. So Hammurabi gave us the code of Hammurabi, dating from about 1700 BCE. The code of Hammurabi was found preserved on a seven-foot-high black stone pillar. In the top, at the top, Hammurabi is depicted as standing in front of Shamash, the Babylonian and Sumerian god of justice, like ancient lawgivers. For example, Moses. Hammurabi received the legal code from the deities or from a god. In fact, he claimed that God, uh, that he was chosen by God, and he said, I knew and Baal called me by name, me, Hammurabi, the exalted prince who feared God, to bring about the rule of righteousness in the land. Now, Hammurabi's code is a set of 282 laws. Focusing on an eye for an eye kind of justice that is adapted for social status. So, for example, an injured slave does not get the same kind of justice as a landowner. Now, this stone pillar with Hammurabi's law on it was discovered in 1901 in what is now Iran. Some examples of Hammurabi law or Hammurabi's law include: if anyone ensnare another, putting a ban upon him, he cannot prove it, then he. Sh then he that ensnared him shall be put to death. Or if anyone brings an accusation of any crime before the elders and can't prove what he's charged, if a capital offense is charged, he will be put to death. If a son strikes his father, his hand shall be hewn off. So again, this pretty severe justice. Now this is the end of part two of chapter one. Please continue with part three.